Good morning, friends. I'm Sandra Clay. I'm the pastor at Cooks United Methodist Church, and I am glad that we could spend these moments together. Uh, a hearty welcome to those of you who are joining us um, live stream, just like you do um, most mornings, like Cindy and Ruth. We're so glad to see you. Welcome to those of you who are finding us maybe for the very first time or you find us a little later uh, after you've gotten the word. Uh, we're just glad that we have an opportunity to um, connect this way. And welcome to those of you who are going to find us way later stumbling around uh, in the internet. We want you to know, all three groups of you, <clears throat> that we love you and that we are praying for you that you would know these two things you've heard me say it a jillion times now that god is for you and that god loves you um, more than you could ever imagine or ask that's scriptural my friends and so we pray that you would trust in that our goal simply in these uh, moments together to start uh, our mornings monday through thursday is to um, remind ourselves of how we have already experienced that truth and how we can trust that God <clears throat> loves us in this moment um, with all of its uh, weirdness, with all of its hope, with whatever it is that we face. So welcome, welcome, welcome. You're very welcome. Um, you're very welcome, Stacy. Stacy was thanking us for prayers, and that is important. So let me say one more thing before we begin to study. Um, whether you find us much later or whether you find us um, as we're sharing these moments together, um, the folks that you see popping up on the screen and telling each other good morning and wishing each other well, uh, offering prayers for one another, they are trustworthy, my friends. And so uh, we are not perfect, but we know that we are in this together. And so from across the state and in many other places outside of the state of Tennessee, there are folks who are gathering their hearts and our mind, their minds, uh, and they are dependable. So if you have a joy to share, share it. That makes it even greater. And if you have a concern that you want uh, help uh, to face, uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, and because it's Facebook, you can click on a name later. You can find us on our uh, Facebook page, but you can also go to our website. You can find us on YouTube and reach out to the church. If you need something, my friends, uh, we are in this together. God has given us to each other. Sometimes that's um, a blessing. Sometimes that's a, a blessing beyond description. Sometimes it's a pain in the neck, uh, but we are always better because we have worked through, <clears throat> um, worked through being the body together. So here we go. Last morning um, that we'll be gathering this week uh, next week brings a whole new season, y'all. Just remember, uh, those of you who uh, maybe this is not familiar to, uh, Wednesday of next week is Ash Wednesday. That begins the season of Lent traditionally and historically in the church. That's been a season of uh, six weeks uh, leading up to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection. We remember his journey toward the cross. We remember that uh, Jesus did that so that we might know life. We also look at his life as a pattern of discipleship. There, the Lenten season is rich with so, so much. And if you're looking for uh, options to be able to celebrate or to observe a meaningful Lenten season, uh, we've got some options. Check out our website. Um, listen to us for worship. You'll hear all the announcements and stuff there. So anyway, time is rolling on. So here we are today, this is how I want us to close the week, um, is we've been talking about the hard part of discipleship and often the hardest part is what we think about ourselves and uh, how we talk ourselves into or out of trusting God. <clears throat> Sometimes the hardest journey we have is from here to here, from our head to our heart. And so I want us to look at this beautiful verse in uh, Psalm 34. If you have a chance, read the whole psalm. But there is something unique about this verse in that uh, there's a phrase that starts uh, the verse. 
uh, and it's used in many places in scripture, but this is the only place that it is meant to talk about the believer. Um, so here we go. I'm going to read it, and then we got quite a bit of work to do, emotional work, spiritual work today to be able to let this truth, this promise be ours. Are you ready? Psalm 34 verse 5 says, those who look to God will shine. Their faces are never ashamed. Well, that might not be what you were thinking of as a pivotal promise of God, uh, but I wanna, I'm going to prove that to you. In the New American Standard translation, this uh, verse is um, written, uh, it's, uh, the, the verse in scripture is actually in the past tense. They, the ones who, it's not talking about a particular uh, group of people except those who look to God and that's exactly what they looked to God and were radiant. That's a past tense. But no matter the translation, the second phrase of that verse is always future. So whether we're talking about in the past, those people looked to God, it becomes our present promise. That's why the common English that I read for you can legitimately be translated um, and faithfully so as a current promise. A, a promise for right now, but it's also a promise for the future. Those who look to God will shine. Their faces are never ashamed. And so let's take, uh, let's let's do quick work. Really, uh, let's do quick work of some of these things to of the, these words and phrases to make sure we know exactly where we're headed. Um, to shine what does it mean for us to shine you know you you know what happens when people are really happy they just kind of radiate that it's not just that they've got a smile on Pl plenty of people paste a false smile on just to throw you off so that you don't ask why or what or mm. so to shine really is to radiate and we know what that's all about the same word shine there was used uh, to talk of Moses when when uh, Moses had spent time in God's presence. Well, who who wouldn't? Who, who wouldn't? And so that means exactly what we think it means. Um, when we when the scripture refers to faces, um, it's both literal and figurative. And what I mean by that is literally their faces. You can see their faces shine. People can see ours shine. When we uh, are at peace, when we are happy, when there is joy at the core of who we are, well, you know, you know. And so that leads us to the figurative use of that word too. And that is your appearance. I mean, how you are. So it's not just your literal face. It really is your appearance, your presence with someone and your presence is never ashamed. Uh, I want to go back um, and look at that phrase, those who look to God. So uh, literal and figurative um, uses here. There is a literal um, notion of looking to God. You turn your face, you turn your body, your posture and how you um, uh, avail yourself of the presence of God that is always with you is like choosing to be present with God. So it, there is a, a kind of a thin layer here of the literal, those who look to God, you use your eyes, you, you, you move your body. But the most important part of that look to really is about considering beholding think about you don't just see it with your eyes there is a there is an embedded reality of focus and honing in I those who pay attention to God those who really see those who observe those who regard with pleasure those who look intently at those are all fair and 
acceptable translations of that phrase, look to God, those who offer respect. And it's not just respect, deference, it's respect, soak it in, respect, listen to, respect, trust in the one who is present with us. But the most important part, I think, of this verse, at least for its implications in uh, our lives, in our culture today, is for us to do hand-to-hand -hand combat with this business of being ashamed. Shame is a feeling. Guilt is a fact. And we get those confused all the time. And we use those in our relationships with people all the time to be able to elicit what we would like to elicit from them, often because we're looking for some relief ourselves. So bare bones, shame uh, is the painful feeling of distress or maybe humiliation that is caused by our awareness, our consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. Now, I would even go so far as to say that for some of us, when we say wrong behavior, I'm not just talking about right and wrong in God's perspective. I'm talking about what somebody else might define for me as wrong. Parents really like it when their children, especially early on, are worried about what's wrong in mama's eyes or daddy's eyes, and we honor or respect that. But it leads to carrying this weight often when the very tiny things that are simple mistakes, um, our behavior is wrong we're not wrong. Does, does that make sense? And so shame is a painful feeling because you are aware that you have fallen short. Why do we have to do business with this word shame or think about what it means for us to be ashamed? I want to read the verse again and now we're going to talk about God's grace. Those who look to God, those who focus on, those who attend to, those who respect, those who regard with pleasure, this one God who creates us, redeems us, sustains us, glorifies us, the, those who look intently to and at, yeah, are never ashamed. They are never stuck in that feeling of distress or, a hu or humiliation because they are aware of their wrong or foolish behavior. That's not our lot for those whose lives are hidden in Jesus. This is what I want you to hear is that grace um, is one of the best ways for us to understand ashamed especially from a scriptural standpoint. So when I've defined shame, I've defined it using our vernacular. But when scripture says their faces, their presence, their literal face, but also their presence will never be, will never be ashamed. You're not going to be the very presence of disgrace, humiliation, distress. Did you hear that first word? Disgrace. As as if it's been removed or taken away from us. That's the point I want you to hear more than anything. Our faces, our very presence, those who look to God, doesn't mean we're perfect, but we will never be disgraced. Here's the proof that I want you to, to hang on to for a few minutes here. Grace is the very... Um, tool is uh, really too utilitarian, but, uh, but it helps us get started. Grace is the avenue by which God redeems us, God renews us, 
God justifies us, makes us right with God. We can't do that on our own. God sanctifies us. God glorifies us. It is all by the grace of God. And that is never taken away from us. You can reject it if you want to. You can deny it if you want to. But God never takes it away. A couple of verses from uh, the Old Testament um, about shame and grace. Uh, both of them from Isaiah. Isaiah 50 uh, verse 7. The Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Isaiah 61 verse 7. Instead of your shame. This is the prophet speaking the words of God to the people. The whole nation of Israel. Instead of your shame. There will be a double Portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice at their lot, at what comes to them. New Testament, Ephesians is full of references to the riches of God's grace being given to us. Second Corinthians, Paul talks about God's grace being enough in any circumstance for any search away, a situation. James, the book of James, uh, says more than one time, God just keeps giving more grace and more grace. God does not withhold or remove grace. Why would God, if that is the avenue by which he uh, calls you to himself, uh, that's the avenue by which he shows you how much you're loved. Why would he withhold from us the very thing that's going to convince us that God is for us and that God loves us? No wonder this becomes a powerful verse for us, a reminder that we shall never be disgraced. Those who look to God will shine out of confidence and out of courage because we know that we know that we know that no one can tear us from this relationship with God. We belong to God. God belongs to us. And our faces are never ashamed. Guilty, maybe. But ashamed? Ashamed is letting that feeling of unworthiness and embarrassment, humiliation and disgrace speak to us as if it is true. And you will not be disgraced as a child of God. God don't work that way. But I will tell you the enemy uses those feelings of ours time and time again to compound the lie. Shame says, I am beyond repair. Not true. Shame would say, this is it. I'm now disqualified. Grace says, not true. The enemy will use this as a lie, my friends, to tear you from peace, mercy, and love that it is your promise in God through Jesus the Christ. So here's the hard work. I, I want you to be honest. I hope and I'm praying that you will spend some time over the next few days uh, honestly, uh, sincerely considering what lies you have allowed to live close to your heart because of shame? A, a, a time where you failed or a, a time where you were ignorant, a time where you were willful, um, a moment when you were rebellious. God's grace is sufficient for the trouble that we bring on ourselves as well as the trouble that life brings us and because God's intent is to grace you into new life in Jesus the Christ that grace will never be withheld from you you shall never be dis
graced. Look to God, not to your failures. Look to God, not to um, how you've uh, fallen short. Look to God instead of, look to what you have instead of what you think you don't have or what you are not. And may you allow God's grace to make you shine. Well, the world needs some more shiny people. Mm -hmm. So to see that there is hope, to see that God is real, to see that love wins, to see that we are in this together. The world needs us to shine, my friends. Those who look to God will. We will shine. And our faces will never be ashamed. Lord, I thank you that there is someone or many someones hearing my voice who, who are still wondering if you love them because of what they've done, because of what they've allowed, because of how slow they've been to respond to you. Whatever their heart issues, Lord, remind them even now that they are always and forever loved. You are love. There is nothing else in your nature. And we can allow the consequences of our willfulness or our rebellion, our mistakes and our falling short. We can allow those things to become a barrier, but that is not your intent for us. And you have poured enough grace and will continue to offer grace to us in such measure that we can know that we know that we know that you are for us and that you love us. Help us to be courageous enough to recognize your voice above the enemies and for and for to have courage God that's I long for each person who hears my voice to have the courage enough that when words that would lead them to shame or uh, are spoken by those around them that they will hear your voice of truth above that and for those Lord who would love to use our guilt the times when we have fallen the times when we have hurt another to keep us under the umbrella of shame and humiliation give us courage Lord to trust that even when others can't see it we know the truth because we allow your voice to ring loud in our heads and our hearts that we are yours that we are loved and that that moment whatever it was is not our defining moment the divine defining truth is that we belong to you we love you so much Lord and we've got a lot of junk to clean out of our souls oh we want to shine for you it's not about polishing ourselves up it is about allowing the very light that you make us to be to shine so that the world can see. That's what we want. Oh, God, help us do our work so that that truth is our truth. We love you. We love you. In the name of love himself, we pray. Amen. I'm so glad to have been able to spend time with you this morning. I hope that your heart is made glad by God's truth, too. Enjoy your weekend. Stay warm and stay dry and stay off the road if you can, my friends. We're praying for those of you who are dealing with the ice and snow even now. See ya.